Good afternoon, everyone. In the interest of time, I think we should get started. I want to welcome you all to the panel from LEO to Deep Space, what every space actor needs for mission success. So that's a pretty cryptic title, isn't it? But if you read the description, you, the, the secret ingredient we're talking about here is assured access to radio frequency spectrum from the point in space that, that you're operating from. It could be LEO, it could be GEO, it could be the moon or deep space. It's an, a mission critical element for, for any space actor. So that's what we're talking about today. And in particular, we'll be talking about how a diverse range of operators work with the other UN body that does space, the ITU. Uh, so we're gonna shed a little light on this, or demystify this topic for you today. So, you know, Spectrum is an unlimited, uh, invisible, natural resource and woe to the mission planner who fails to plan for it, how it will be used in their system way in advance. And sadly, it happens very commonly. So I'm glad to see so many people here who are going to start to learn about this very critical part of any space mission. So without any further ado, let's dive in. First of all, we'll try to have time for questions at the end. So I think you all know about the Slido um, way of uh, pre uh, providing questions to us. But uh, we're going to go through our panel now and start our discussion. Uh, we have, we're representing, we've got the uh, space Agency, we've got one of our new LEO system, commercial LEO constellations represented on the panel. We have our traditional communication satellite industry represented on the panel, a national regulator, and we're happy to have with us uh, an expert from the ITU's Radio Communication Bureau. So uh, we will introduce ourselves as we go down our first question, which we'll start with Mr. Badri Yunus from NASA. Uh, so Badri, could, could you kick us off on our discussion by telling us how NASA works with and through the ITU to achieve its missions? Thank you, Audrey. Um, I am definitely Badri Yunus. I am the Deputy Associate Administrator I'm also the uh, program manager for NASA space um, uh, communications and navigations, responsible for anything, uh, you know, all of, all of the networks that support uh, NASA missions and some of our partners, and to include the spectrum uh, and the spectrum management. Um, in order to understand the relationship that NASA has with the ITU, we need to touch on the NASA mission uh, and objectives. NASA, as well as many other space agencies, and I'm not going to speak for, for them, but I'm, you know, they have similar interests as NASA. Uh, if not all of them, are about science, the collection of science. Whether we go to a LEO location, or send spacecraft to a GEO, anywhere in the planetary system, and well beyond, we have spacecraft that have, uh, that have gone beyond the edge of the solar systems. Uh, these spacecrafts, they need to be uh, commanded, controlled. They need to send data back to Earth. But also, one of the critical things they do is they collect science. How does NASA collect science? How do we collect science? All of these spacecraft are instrumented to operate and explore the full potential of the electromagnetic spectrum. We do a lot of remote sensing we use the passive band as well as active band to collect our science. Whether we are looking down on Earth doing Earth observation science, or looking at the sun doing heliophysics, or exploring our planets, or looking at the, gazing at the stars and doing astrophysics, we rely on this electromagnetic spectrum to look at some of the elements that may give us a, an idea about what we are studying. 
in the case of looking down at Earth, we are looking at the resonant frequencies of certain molecules to see their abundance or lack of, to make a decision on the, the presence of water or presence of bacteria in the ocean or, or so on. So, uh, you know, without that spectrum, whether it's for command and control communication, you know, our astronauts, when they go to the International Space Station and pretty soon to the moon and beyond, they really are going to depend on that electromagnetic spectrum for communication and also for navigation. So all of these things, you know, if they are not available, there is no way for us to accomplish our mission and objectives. That's why we have teamed up with the ITU. We are an active member uh, within the ITU. Um, and it's uh, d definitely a partnership. We use the ITU to ensure there is a harmony in the allocation of the uh, frequencies, how it's been used by different services. And we also work with the other sectors of the ITU. We have worked with the ITU with the, with the R sector, but we also with the D sector. Depending. NASA has been a key player in uh, advancing communication capabilities worldwide and building capacity. So it's a partnership, but also it's a forum where all of these things are discussed, coordinated, and harmonized. Thank you so much, Badri. That's a great start. Next, let's turn to Julie Zoller uh, from Amazon Kuiper. Julie. Thanks, Audrey, and, uh, and thank you for having me on this panel. You know, I, I look to my right, and I see friends that I've known for 25 years. <laughs> and I look to my left, and, and it, not quite as long, but many years we've, we've all known and worked with each other. It's a, it's a small community up here and one that I've found to be mutually supportive and, and very beneficial. Um, I've been at Project Kuiper at Amazon for just three years now, and Am Kuiper is Amazon's low Earth orbiting broadband l system, consisting of 3,236 satellites at three altitudes, 590, 610, 630 kilometers. And our mission is to provide broadband access to unserved and underserved communities around the world. It's a super exciting project for me. Um, I would say s since I've been working in the satellite field for, for all of this time, but also since the regulatory routes that we're now applying at Kuiper, I was there at Work 97 developing. Um, so it's really, really awesome to be here. ITU plays an essential role for us, first of all, starting out with the satellite network filings for, for Kuiper, which we submitted to the ITU in 2019, and we count on the ITU to examine them for compliance with the radio regulations to look at the equivalent power flux density limits that we adopted over 20 years ago and make sure that um, there's compliance there in, in all the satellite network filings. And to ask us questions if, if they have questions about our, our filings. We also depend on the ITU to run the World Radio Communication Conference process because it's through the work process and the updating of the international radio regulations, that treaty that we all follow, that we provide opportunity for new technologies like Kuiper. And I'll mention a couple of agenda items at WRC 23 next year that are important to Kuiper. And, and the first one is 1.16, which is enabling Earth stations in motion for non-geostationary systems in the Ka band like Kuiper. And I'm very optimistic that WARC 23, as WARC 19 did for geos, will approve provisions to the radio regs for eSIMs. And then 17 gigahertz, um, agenda item 1.19, additional spectrum in the Americas 
for downlinks in the 17 gigahertz band. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, it shows how these world radio conferences, which we will continue to discuss, enable new, new ideas, new services, but while ensuring protection of incumbent services from harmful interference. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that when we get to the end of the row. So next up, let's hear from Artie Halla, who's joined us today. She's the Secretary General of JASOA, and she's going to tell us what that is. Go ahead, Artie. Thank you very much, Audrey. Thanks for inviting me to be part of this session. It's an honor to be with all the colleagues today. Um, uh, JISOA is the Global Satellite Operators Association. Many of you will know us as ESOA. We were uh, the EMEA Satellite Operators Association until January this year. Uh, we represent the common interests of 29 satellite operators, all providing satellite communication services. And we have operators that um, uh, provide, geo, provide services in GEO, MEO, and LEO uh, orbits. So we really provide thought leadership for the sector and help um, decision makers and influencers all around the world understand how satellite can serve their objectives from the sustainable development goals uh, to emergency communications to even extending the reach of 5G and in the future 6G. Um, we work with different organizations, sometimes at technical level, for example, 3GPP, where we have uh, supported the um, emergence of standards for um, 5G new radio to support NTN or 5, 5G um, NBIOT to support uh, NTN. Uh, but we also work um, with the ITU in particular, not just on spectrum, but also on development issues. Um, when it comes to um, the I2, I think, of course, the fundament is the World Radio Conference. Satellite systems being global in nature, satellite operators relying on global or, or at least on regional markets. Uh, we, our, our systems are, are blind to national board, board, uh, boundaries. And therefore, we, we really welcome and support and want to preserve the global um, decision-making uh, process that is driven by the ITU and provided within the context of the WRC. There are many uh, key agenda items for our sector. Um, some of them go to the traditional, the traditional fights of protecting the C-band, but all the way to looking to the future, uh, as Julie mentioned, making sure that NGSO systems also uh, find their place within the regulatory framework and that it continues to evolve uh, in support of an evolving sector. Um, I think I'd leave it there for now. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we're going to, to, to change the focus a little bit and talk to a representative of a, of a national reg, uh, regulator, because uh, as we all know from studying the Outer Space Treaty, our operations in space must be through a, 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 a nation state. So we have Amar here, who's going to, who rep, who wor works for the uh, French Frequency Agency to tell us more about what he does as a, as a member state. Thank you. Thank you, Amar. Thank you, Audrey. Um, thanks to invite me to this panel. Uh, just some words to explain my, my work, in fact. Um, that, of course, takes place uh, helping, in fact, the satellite industry, but also uh, the newcomers to space to access this uh, resource that is spectrum in fact uh, just to ex to say that my job this is to uh, in fact to to declare frequencies to the ITU on behalf of my operators whether they are big operators or very small and very new ones and to help them in doing this the second is to uh, give them some license in fact to transfer to them the rights and the obligations France have to the ITU to those companies, in fact, to respect the rules that have been internationally agreed. So just to, to give you an overview of the, the, the kind of operators we have, um, the French administration is uh, the administration for uh, all the French governmental and commercial satellites, but also for the Galileo constellation of the European Commission, all the scientific uh, satellites from the European Space Agency, and also some old frequencies used by the intergovernmental organization Eutelsat. And 
you uh, will see some of my operators downstairs, even small ones, you will see Unseen Labs, but also the small company Promete. This is uh, newcomers to space that we help uh, to obtain uh, the spectrum resources uh, and to register them at ITU level. Also, you will see that the French administration is uh, uh, involved into uh, some well-known constellation as OneWeb, but also O3B, Telesat, uh, the small constellation of Utelsat, and also uh, Global Star constellation. In all those uh, well-known satellite companies, you will find French frequencies, in fact. This is just to give you an overview about the kind of operators we can have and uh, the fact that some of them may be, I would say, non-French companies, but uh, would rely also on French frequencies. <laughs> also, one last element, just to, uh, on my work, I am also the, the chair of a satellite communication group in Europe that promote uh, the use of satellite terminals, of new technologies, and we harmonize, in fact, we create and harmonize uh, the regulation in the European countries uh, to help uh, and to support, in fact, the deployment of uh, satellite solution. And uh, two last words, uh, just to give you um, some ideas about the work that I have with the ITU. Uh, for me, uh, the ITU, this is a day-to-day -day relation. Um, in fact, this is because at the ITU level, only uh, countries are represented. So you have to understand that um, my job with the ITU is to represent my operators uh, in this uh, entity, in fact. So any operator needs to be represented by one country to the ITU. Thank you, also, Omar. Oh, I'm sorry. No? Uh, or maybe one last point. Just okay. one last, this is just to give you um, for me, uh, the ITU, uh, this is not uh, only a tool to secure the, the investment you need uh, to realize a new project. Uh, for an administrator, uh, regulator like me, uh, the ITU, it is also uh, the last place where you can talk with some countries when the political situation is difficult. And uh, as I would say, uh, one part of the United Nations, this is also uh, a place where I would say we can work um, in collaboration with other countries. A Thank very you. important point. Thank you very much. Well, so our, our final speaker is our ITU representative, Jorge Sicarossi. So please. Thank you, Audrey, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first, let me say a big it, it is a real pleasure and privilege to be here representing ITU at IAC in Paris, but also to share the panel with such distinguished speakers and the audience that really realize about the importance of the spectrum. That's why they are here. No? Uh, also, that uh, even though I'm representing ITU, in fact, we have to say that ITU is all what they have said. So we are all ITU, the GSO operators, the NGS operators, space agencies, the civil society and, and of course, the, the member states. So, um, yes, uh, well, you, you mentioned a little bit about background very quickly. So my last 20 years were devoted to space system coordination in Geneva at ITU. And uh, when you ask how we are cooperating or collaborating, in fact, uh, if, if you remember, or at least, well, I was not born yet, but in 1963, there was a, a first uh, space conference in Geneva, and since then, uh, these almost 60 years of space regulation were those which uh, contributed to the current scenario we have today, you know, in terms of thousands of satellite networks deployed, operating, and, and even more uh, planned. And sometimes it looks a little bit invisible when we speak about the spectrum, but if we, we think about what we use today, everybody, from the uh, handset up to any internet connection at home, always in this network of networks, there is a, a piece of satellite connectivity. So all this, thanks to the cooperation between member states and operators, were, uh, was possible. No? So how, how is that we did this? Well, this has been done through the, this uh, regular cycle of three to four years world radio conferences plus study groups to ensure the compatibility between the systems. Also, with the assistance that we provide from the, from the Bureau, and uh, the reason why we are also today here is because 
we are uh, witnessing a, a real explosion of, of systems from LEO to infrastructure on the moon and beyond, which is great, it's, it's really uh, very inspirational. But we also want to cooperate on that just to, to remind that there is always a piece of, of a, a small component there, not so small sometimes, which is the radio spectrum, which every single object which is launched to space needs to, to take into account. And we really need coordination for that as well. So that's the main reason. And if I have to just provide a final message for this first round of questions uh, to save time, I would say, please keep innovating because what we are seeing is, is great. And at the same time, get in touch with the regulators and come to ITU and uh, you will find the solution. And if for any reason you don't find the frequency band you need at that moment, just make a proposal for the next conference and for sure you will get a solution. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Well, let's uh, do a, another round with our panel and, and let's talk about the future. And uh, I'll give you a choice. Do you want to talk about what you foresee the future will bring in your, in your work with the ITU in the near or far future? Or is there some, something that you see needs to be changed in how we deal with the ITU? Baudry? Definitely. Um, there will be change, you know. The, the Moon uh, to, to Mars mission, the Artemis program, is going to change some of the rules we have been playing with. Also, the commercialization uh, that's taken place, commercialization of communication services in and around the globe, also is going to challenge, challenge the existing regulatory fra framework. NASA uh, has undertaken uh, you know, a major initiative to commercialize all of uh, its services, calm services. And uh, you know, I'm doing that to, to free up most of my resources uh, to, 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 to work on the next generation of communication capabilities and technology. I don't want to be doing uh, routine stuff. Uh, so, uh, you know, the future is going to look so very different from the way it is today. Uh, we are going to have spacecraft crisscrossing the skies, uh, soliciting support from any system up there, not from government-owned and operated dedicated systems, but from any provider, be that a commercial provider or, uh, you know, a, another, uh, you know, like a government entity providing that capability. I need my user to be able to roam in space without being impeded by the constraint of the regulatory process. I want my user to have the maximum flexibility to have call and access uh, on demand. So a lot of technology is in the work now. We, I'm working on a number of technology uh, to include uh, multilingual uh, uh, payloads, multilingual mo modems, uh, the kind of uh, multi, uh, you know, modems that can operate in any frequency and be able to reconfigure on the fly to any waveform. If I cannot force interoperability on the providers, I can force the interoperability at the user end. Uh, this is a different scenario from the moon. The moon, there, there are no providers there, and uh, we are the first customer, so we are deciding on the rules of the game in coordination with other space agencies, primarily, you know, ESA, JAXA, and all of the other agencies. We have assigned uh, a person to manage and coordinate all of the frequency activities, and also we have put out interoperability standards that any entity that's, uh, that's to play in and around the moon will have to, buy, uh, to abide by it. We are going to force that interoperability to maximize the utilization and the benefit of any system up there. Going back to the near Earth environment, I can, because I cannot force it on existing uh, providers that are already well established, I'm looking into the future. What kind of technology that, that will allow me uh, to, to uh, override the choppy regulatory uh, waves? <laughs> um, I would like to go to optical communication. It's not regulated. It can be shared by all kinds of services. So we are investing heavily in optical communication, to put that, the kind of uh, technology that will provide maximum flexibility to go space to space, space to ground, even uh, uh, you know, near Earth to deep space. I'm investing, uh, yeah, what, a couple of yeah. short things. Investing in cognitive technology. You know, we believe in autonomous operation navigation. 
in the future, the existing way we do, we allocate and schedule services is not going to work as the space is going to be highly congested. And so the way we are doing it now will be uh, not optimum for the future. So cognitive technology, leaving, it, leaving the decision and the management of resources and capabilities on board the spacecraft to manage access and negotiate with the provider. Along with many other technology, Definitely, we are paving the way to the 2030s where quantum networking and quantum communication become a real thing. Sorry for taking oh, this long. Well, that's quite a long list, and we're going yeah. to need a lot of real talent to help invent the technologies and the regulations that can accommodate them. Julie, what are your thoughts? Hey, thanks, Audrey. Um, I'll, I'll talk in a couple of respects about change. And, and Baudry mentions technology again and the evolution of technology and light touch regulation so that you're able to evolve. And, and I, that resonates with me big time. Um, the tension between protecting incumbents and enabling new technology has only grown more fierce over time at the ITU. Um, you know, everywhere I look, it's worst case upon worst case upon worst case assumption. And it's like pulling a, a very heavy weight along. And, uh, and sometimes we end up with a half page of a footnote to the table of frequency allocations that, you know, thank goodness for experts um, in the regulatory arena are able to understand and apply. But I just, I hope we can go lighter touch in the future I want to also mention the issue of paper satellites, which seems to be growing again. Last year alone, uh, hundreds of thousands, maybe more than a million NGSO satellites were filed at the ITU. Um, the due diligence procedures we adopted many years ago aren't handling that. So we have to think of, of other tools, maybe. Uh, have the two th new ones from 2019. Cost recovery, oh dear. <laughs> perhaps um, so, something new. And and last, I'll say, space sustainability is becoming a, a bigger and bigger point of discussion. We're committed to space sustainability at Kuiper and at, at Amazon. It's a topic of growing interest for regulators and, and operators alike. The mission of the ITUR is to administer the radio regulations and ensure there's no harmful interference between services. But part of doing that is knowing from where on the orbit satellites are transmitting and receiving, knowing the inclination and the altitude and the argument of perigee and so on. And now ITU is talking about what, what should be the orbital tolerance allowed for non-geostationary systems. This is important information that has a, a relationship to the space sustainability uh, conversation. And I just want to give a shout out to my friends, Veronique Glade and Cece, um, Karina, who so aptly noted in their paper presented here yesterday that a realistic ITU Master International Frequency Register ensures a more sustainable and predictable space environment. Thank you. Great thought. Artie, do you have any thoughts to share? Yes, sure. Um, so when, I, when we think about uh, the ITU, when we think about anything in the digital space, change, evolution, keeping pace is the order of the day. What that actually means, what that translates into, the jury is out on so many different issues. But I think in terms of the ITU, it's uh, not only facing pressure from the pace of innovation that is happening, especially within our sector, within the satellite industry and the space sector, but also um, from now the move from mobile terrestrial to start thinking about 6G and talking about 6G spectrum and saying that you know we cannot wait 10 years for spectrum to become available. We need to make it available now so that the development can happen in order to be brought to market on time. 
Um, so we have a dichotomy in this sense of, of tensions, like Julie mentioned, but there's also, as we emerge from the pandemic, there is a lot less tolerance amongst member states for the digital divide. Um, there is a lot of uh, demand now that you know we we worry about our citizens, we worry about the future in the wake of not only the pandemic but climate change, increasing emergencies. So this is um, where satellite is really called upon to assume its responsibility to deliver on the expectations of member states, and again uh, where the ITU therefore has an extremely important role to play to set the scene and provide the backdrop for that. Um, uh, I think there are some very interesting questions out there when we when we take a deep dive into some of these issues. And in the past, we used to see um, on the terrestrial side, mobile broadcasting as the holy grail. Will they ever be able to do it? And the new thing in our sector is direct access from satellites to smartphones. That's like the holy grail. Nobody really knows if it exists. Will it ever happen? Will it materialize? But what does that mean in terms of the radio regulations? Um, in, you know, you, you could just see this as a non-conforming use of spectrum, or you could say, well, we've got Article 4.4 that allows anything as long as you have an agreement that you're not going to interfere. So, you know, these are the kind of things that the IT is going to have to think about going forward. And the future is interesting. I don't know if it's bright, but it's certainly interesting. Well, thank you, and, and we haven't talked about it here, but one of the primary purposes of the ITU, besides avoidance of harmful interference, is making available new services to the world's inhabitants. Uh, so, you know, there, there's all these tensions in the work that ITU does, but we do want to make new services to, available. Amar, did you want to add anything? Yeah, thank you, Audrey. Um, maybe the just to give you... Uh, in the next couple of months, uh, or ne or next year, my uh, work with ITU will be mainly focused on the preparation of the WRC 23. Um, I fully agree with Julie that uh, this agenda item that will enable the use of Earth Station, of uh, satellites on board aircraft, on board vessels, this is very important. Uh, I can understand that sometimes people think that we are going, uh, I would say, too slow and we should do things faster, but uh, let me tell you this story. In Europe, we uh, regulate the use of um, satellite communication on aircraft in 2015. And you see that we will discuss it at the ITU level in 2022. So we are well prepared and I am sure that collaborating with uh, Amazon and uh, your constellation, we will have soon this new service on board uh, any aircraft with uh, broadband communications, thanks to the satellites. Uh, just maybe two points uh, relating to uh, the ITU and maybe the future of the ITU. Uh, this ITU is an old story, but uh, the thing is that as a regulator, we see things um, evolving now. Um, in the past, for example, one satellite was one country, one flag. This is something that is changing now. If you have a look to, uh, for example, the Starlink SpaceX constellation, what is the country behind this constellation? Is it the US? As a regulator, for me, Starlink, this is Norway. Just as an example. I have many of them like this. So. What I would say, the fact that now it's maybe more difficult for me as a regulator to find, if I need to discuss with one system, which country I need to talk with. This is one of the difficulty. The second one, and I agree that uh, for the space sustainability, we need to do more and more things, I think, with the ITU. Maybe sometimes it's difficult to link what people declare to the ITU as said by Julie, one million satellite, non-GSO satellite, and the reality. <laughs> and this is the connection that we may have to face in the next years, to connect what is the real object and what frequency is using this object. So that I think with people that want to find solution, we, are, we will always be able to find, I would say, some spectrum for anyone. Okay. But we need now to go a deeper into the identification of uh, this satellite, who is it, and who's the country 
that has the control of it. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, interesting words. <laughs> Jorge, why don't you tell us more about yes. the ITU and the upcoming conference? But first, I think I have to answer several <laughs> issues with <laughs> addressed by order. <laughs> so, and, and thanks for, for, for addressing these topics. Believe me, they were not coordinated at all. It's, it's really spontaneous. So space sustainability, cost recovery for NGSO, certainly. Cost recovery for NGSO, obviously, obviously is very welcome. Today is not reflecting the real world. And uh, as, as you say, Julie, there are many paperwork which then end up in, in one or two networks only. So this perhaps should you, be... You might available. explain what the cost recovery is, just br very briefly Cost recovery is, is, is the fee which should be paid for a, a project. So to give an idea, uh, if a project may be one or 10 billions, I think, <laughs> of NGSO, the fees at ITU are something like $50,000 and involves a lot of process in terms of calculations and publications. So uh, this is a workload which is not properly reflected and also could help in eliminating the paper uh, cycle in future as it was in the past for the GSO and today they are very well identified uh, who is who, let's say. So, but nevertheless, we, we have to say that for the GSO, it's, it's today is our, I think, our main uh, income, let's say, and it will be for, for, for always, I think. Uh, but, okay, that's about the cost recovery. Space sustainability and space monitoring. And again, thanks for addressing this. Space monitoring is something which is really becoming more and more relevant from every perspective, from optic, but also from the radio frequency point of view, of course. And today I would say that we are really identifying very well the objects. Eh? So uh, there are a lot of uh, information available in public domain, so we really have a, a good track of that. And there are studies on tolerance, as Julie said, which if we f uh, make the fusion between this data plus several sources, we will really get a good uh, synchronization of our databases with any other database, if you wish, just to be sure who is uh, in which boxes, either GSO or non-GSO, with certain limit of tolerance, because of course, uh, we don't need also a big, big accuracy, but we need some, some tolerance. Uh, so these are things which are coming. I think uh, spectrum monitoring, as I said, uh, and space monitoring is important. Uh, sometimes I used to say, if we cannot measure, we cannot manage it. So we really need to apply this also for, for our field. And uh, just to wrap up some things about the future, uh, I think that there is, there will be more and more interaction between more players or actors. In the past, it was more state-oriented. Today, we see more cooperation and, and participation from the industry. We see it here in this panel, uh, directly with, in ITU, always uh, accompanied with the regulator. So there is more uh, collaboration in that sense uh, and together with ITU and it will be continue or improved even. Um, and if we look at to the future, we just have these slides for you if you want to take a photo just to have it very quickly. These are the next uh, three events which would be important to you. Uh, of course, the WRC 23 next year in Dubai. Uh, and there we have a, a very nice menu de jour if you wish. <laughs> Uh, but they were mentioned, some of them already, I would say maybe inter-satellite links. For example, let's remember the one, agenda item 117. Uh, so today there are, for example, if we go to the remote sensing, there are images with high resolution taken from LEO, but then they need to be uploaded to a GSO to be relayed to the, to the ground with a huge capacity. So this is something which is, is needed and it will, it will come. It's just shaping the, the way, the regulatory way. Uh, of course, tam also uh, mobility is back after the pandemic, we saw it, and uh, we have uh, almost 3 billion of people which are not connected today in the world, and uh, this needs to be improved, and one of the ways, together with the mobility is back, is through the SIMS, through NGSO, and GSO, which, has, which are already providing a good coverage. And uh, yeah, and of course, there may be some new agenda items for uh, WRC 27, which may be also, why not, uh, some identification of frequency for in-orbit servicing. We are seeing here in the exhibition that it's a fact, it's a reality. The infrastructure on the moon for communication, perhaps in principle, will be agreed between some players, but in future there may be, we'll see, some need to regulate a little bit that. 
NASA may have different view, or I don't know, we'll see. Uh, but when there are a lot of plays, like it happened in the history at the beginning, there is a need for more flexibility, then it has to be a little bit more regulated, so we, we'll see. And uh, yeah, for sure, some coordination is required, as, as we have seen. So this is more or less how we envision the future. Well, thank you, Jorge. Badri. Yeah, definitely. NASA, at no time, NASA wants to be a regulator. <laughs> you know, the reason we stepped in, because we saw a potential for conflict. So we put, you know, we assigned someone to regulate, not necessarily regulate, coordinate. Mm -hmm. And also we put out uh, interoperability standard. We are starting from a clean slate, so it's better to do it right. Uh, definitely in the future, you know, the ITU, a strong ITU, is a, is a reliable partner, would like, uh, as the population density on the moon and different interests start to move in, would like to pull out, but we have, we'll have already laid the foundation for a manageable situation instead of as, you know, because really establishing a regulatory process and going through the ITU may take a little bit of time. And uh, so we cannot afford that. We are already going there. We are introducing system. We are designing system that will need to operate there. So we took the initiative. At no time we want to replace the ITU, nor any of the uh, you know, other national uh, regulatory uh, bodies. Thank you. So uh, just a reminder, if you have any questions, use the Slido app. I haven't seen any yet. Uh, something that's come up, uh, Jorge mentioned, is the ability of the private sector to have a role in what the ITU is working on and, and to the studies that inform the decisions of these world radio conferences every four years. And that, that is a distinguishing characteristic of the ITU uh, compared to other international organizations. And quite frankly, is probably the key to its, its long success. But um, I was wondering, Julie, um, in terms of, you're a sector member, right? Uh, of two sectors. Of two se Can you talk a little bit about how the, I mean, certainly it's only member states at a treaty conference, which is what the World Radio Conference is, that can make proposals and negotiate treaties. But how is it that the private sector can influence and, and bring in its knowledge uh, to make things happen that you need to provide your service? Uh, that's a great question. So this week and last, Working Party 4A, which is the satellite technical group at the ITU has been meeting. And the primary focus right now, because the World Radio Conference is next year, is wrapping up the conclusions on the technical studies for the World Radio Conference. And in that regard, members of my team have been very active in performing those analyses, writing input contributions, and then presenting them as members of the US delegation uh, and acting as, as the spokesperson for that paper on the delegation. So it's extremely valuable to have that voice in the ITU and to be able to influence those outcomes. Thank you, yes. Um, we have time for just any final thoughts that you might want to, to add today? Um, Jorge, so you... No, we don't have any. Um, uh, one thing we could recommend to our audience members who are curious about the ITU, but perhaps aren't ready to submit a contribution to Working Party 4A, is the, the World Radio Seminar. Maybe we could show it on the screen. Well, isn't that something you can participate remotely? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, we have a, a World Radio Seminar, so maybe we could... Uh, uh, categorizing three levels, what we have shown just recently. The World Radio Conference, obviously, for experts who, who are uh, making proposals uh, which are responding to a need from the industry. We have also the study groups, which are part of those studies after the World Radio Conference, also for experts. But if you are just a beginner, just approach and come to the, our World Radio Seminar, which will take place uh, middle of October, I think. So the first day is an introductory day with plenary. It's also virtual, so everybody can, can access. And then the following four days is in person this year, and you can see all our software and procedures in Geneva. 
And is it, can, can you participate virtually or remotely? The first day, yes. This the year, first only day, first day. okay. Yeah. And it's available for, for any member yes. of the public, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so that, that's a good opportunity. Amar? Yes, Audrey, I can confirm. I, I would say I, I force all my new operators to participate <laughs> in this seminar <laughs> because there is some very uh, training lessons and uh, you can uh, have there uh, all the advice from the ITU Bureau staff. I see some of them in the room. And uh, of course, if you can see them, uh, I would say you can make pressure on them to obtain your answers <laughs> to the use of their tools. Ardi. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, it should not go unnoticed that the ITU does what other international organizations could only hope to do. It is the largest consensus building process in the world that actually comes out every four year with uh, changes in binding uh, resolutions and obligations. And that is, that's quite a feat. Yes, you know? and we do it without voting. It's called consensus by exhaustion, and it works. <laughs> so, um, well, I would, uh, unless there's any final thoughts, I am going to uh, profusely thank my panelists for joining me today, and all of you for, for joining us for this first ever IAC panel on the role of the ITU in our important space field. So we hope to have more conversations like this, and I'll be doing a little technical talk about Work 23 tomorrow afternoon in E7. If you're really curious, come join us there. Okay, thank you very much, everyone.